we're very conscious, aren't we, that there are many, many conflicts around the world, and we see how war and violence just destroys communities, and it's happening in so many different places today, and it's cause of great sorrow and heartache for all of those who, who live in those areas. But I think it's true to say that there's one particular thing that lies at the root of many of the conflicts, and that's a desire to have authority for one group to dominate over another group, to rule others, and to impose their wishes on those other people. And I think probably lurking in each of us, maybe as an individual or often as a group, there can be that desire to promote ourselves. It's part of what we are. That's our natural inclination, isn't it? To take the top position, uh, to want to call the shots, and to have that supreme place. In other words, to be great. Now, I think it's a healthy ambition to want to be the best that we can be and wherever God has uh, placed us. Uh, it's good to want to use our gifts to the best of our ability and to strive for excellence. But it's unhealthy, isn't it, to have a rivalry with someone else that brings out hostility between ourselves and them. And the subject of the verses that were read earlier on in the service is really greatness. And this is something that interested the disciples of Jesus Christ, because it tells us uh, in this passage, it says, an argument started among the disciples as to which of them would be the greatest. And Jesus said to them in answer to their debate and argument, he who is least among you he is the greatest. Now, isn't it strange? Here's the followers of Jesus, and they've seen Him in all of His humility, and yet they're arguing about what it means to be great. Jesus has just told them that He's going to be betrayed into the hands of men, pointing forward to the cross and His own suffering, and yet they are more concerned about who is going to be number one. And there's a heated debate takes place and Jesus uses this opportunity to teach them something that is absolutely vital in terms of the kingdom of God. And I want just to focus on two things this morning. What, the first one, a little bit uh, more detail, and the second one, uh, more briefly. And I simply want to talk about what I would call greatness in the kingdom. And it says that Jesus, in verse 70, knowing their thoughts… Now, in Mark's gospel, he tells us that Jesus actually asked them, he said, what were you arguing about when you came along the way? We're told that they don't answer Jesus, and maybe it's because they're ashamed of what they've been talking about. And we can assume that their discussion about greatness uh, embraced the world's view of what that means. Now, if we were to ask people today in our society who are the great people, well, I would say many would say, well, it's the celebrities that we are familiar with, those who are in films, those who make music, the sports people. They are the great ones in our culture, the ones who have lots of money, who have the power, who get publicity, people who are on our TV screens and our magazines and our newspapers. And I would say there would be many people in our society who would say it would be great to be with those people, to be able to say, well, I know some of those people, or to be like them. Now, that may be true in our culture, but it's not true in the kingdom of God. And Jesus corrects the disciples' misunderstanding. In the kingdom, it is completely different. And the key to his instruction to the disciples is found in this verse, verse 48, where he says, whoever is the least among you, he is the greatest. So, he's saying that the person who is bottom of the pile, as far as people might be concerned, is actually top of the pile as far as God is concerned. It's the opposite. It is the 
upside-down version of what the world assumes greatness is. Now, what did Jesus mean by saying, he who is least among you is the greatest? Well, to explain that and to illustrate that, he takes a little child. Now, this child may be a toddler, quite small. And he brings that child, and he gets the child to stand beside him. Now, in Matthew's gospel, Jesus tells his disciples that you need to be like this child if you're going to enter the kingdom of God, and that's true as well. But in this case, what he says is this, whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Now, why does Jesus choose a child? What's the significance of that? Well, in the Middle East at this particular time, in the first century, a child was the lowest or lowliest member of their society. A child was very unimportant. A child had nothing to offer adults. They were dependent on adults. They didn't own anything. All that they had was given to them. Children had no authority. They had no power or influence. They were not prominent. Their opinion was not sought. They weren't celebrities. They didn't have a particular position. So, we might say in terms of the society, they were little people. They had no stature or status. And so, what Jesus is saying is this, that greatness is about welcoming and about giving attention to and making much of those who are small and ordinary and lowly. It's about having an interest in them regardless of who they are. Now, let me just stress, this is not about salvation by interest in others, because Jesus says, whoever welcomes this little child in my name. So, this is something that is done in faith from a heart that loves Jesus Christ and therefore wants to serve Him in this day. You see, the danger for us is in our celebrity culture that we might focus more on important people. We might be more inclined to give our attention to those who we think matter most, if you like, the, the big people. But what Jesus is saying is that we need to appreciate and encourage and welcome people in all different parts of our society. And we reach out to them not because of what we can get from them or what they can do for us. We do it not so that we can feel important or impress others, but we do it for them so that we can demonstrate our care and our inclusiveness of them. In Matthew 20, Jesus said to the disciples, if you want to be great, then you make yourself a servant. And here Jesus is saying, even to the little people. In Mark's gospel, as we thought with the children, Jesus said, if you want to be first, you put yourself last. So, the world has a pyramid, doesn't it, in terms of greatness? And the great people are those who are at the top of the pyramid, those who have most people under them, who have the greatest authority. Whereas Jesus is turning that pyramid upside down, and He's saying the great people are those who serve the most. And that is a complete opposite of what our society normally understands by greatness. So, to be the greatest is to be least full of ourselves and most full of others. Humility is not to think less of ourselves, but to think of ourselves less. 
It's not to have a low self-esteem, but it's to esteem others highly. Greatness is not about getting my place and about being treated with respect and given recognition, but it's about giving all of those things to others, especially the lowly. One commentator put it like this, humble service to the Lord's little ones is true greatness. So there we have it. If we want to be great, then from the heart we need to make much of the ordinary and lowly. Now, this is good news for all of us, isn't it? Because it means that greatness, as far as God is concerned, is open to every single person in the kingdom of God. We can all be great. We can all aspire to this. This can be the goal of every single one of us. Because, you see, to be great, you don't have to be a missionary or a minister or an elder or a leader. You don't have to have position in the church or hold office. Any person who believes in and trusts in Jesus Christ and belongs to Him can pursue greatness as far as Jesus Christ is concerned. And that is something that should encourage and inspire every single one of us. We say, I could never be great for God. You might never be a celebrity for God, but you can be great because that's what Jesus says. Whoever is the least among you, He is the greatest. In our garden at the back of the manse, we've got a bird feeder, a couple of bird feeders, and it's lovely to see the birds coming, uh, in, especially in the winter, and they come and they feed at the, the bird feeder. Now, that bird feeder is made for small birds, little finches and blue tits and so on, and those are the ones that come and feed at that feeder. Now, we also in our garden have some magpies, and I'm sure you've seen magpies. They're big. Some people do not like them, but sometimes the magpies try to get onto the feeder and get the nuts out of the feeder, and they can't. And the reason is because they're too big, and they can't hold on properly to the bird feeder. They keep falling off, and their beaks are too big to get in through the wire to get at the peanuts. So the big birds come along, and they get nothing. And the wee birds come along, and they get fed. And what Jesus is saying to us is this, isn't he? It's the small people, or the people who see themselves as small, who get blessed, and the big people don't. Whoever is least among you, he is the greatest. So, greatness in the kingdom. And the second thing that Jesus talks about, and more briefly, is uh, what I simply want to call generosity in the kingdom. Because immediately following this, I don't know whether John is uh, prompted, maybe he feels guilty, and he decides he's going to tell Jesus something about what they did. And he says to Jesus in verse 49, we saw a man driving out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he is not one of us. They didn't recognize him. He wasn't in their group. He wasn't a disciple, and they objected to what he was doing. Now, the disciples could have just noted the fact that this man was trying to cast out demons uh, and just taken a, a, a mental uh, note that that was happening and discussed it among themselves, but they didn't do that. It says here that they said they tried to stop him. They told him that was enough. Now, it sounds like they weren't successful because he says we tried to stop him. But Jesus says to the disciples, do not stop him. And he tells them the reason why. Because or for whoever is not against you is for you. 
So he's saying to him, if he's doing it in my name and he's trying to stand against the kingdom of darkness, then that is okay. Now, I wonder, does this ring a bell with you? Because I would suggest this is something that is alive and well in the 21st century church today. This is something that we are very familiar with, aren't we? In Northern Ireland, the spirit of exclusivism is still with us, and we think about other denominations or other groups, and we say, if they are not one of us, if they're not doing it our way, then they're not doing it right. If they don't believe what we believe, then they are somehow off the mark. Now, it's important for us, isn't it, all to have our own convictions, and that's fine. It's good to have our theology worked out and to be persuaded of what we believe. It's good to have doctrine that we hold on to and to be convinced of what the Bible teaches about certain aspects of Christian living. But there is a danger, isn't there, that when we know of others who differ with us, maybe in some particular area of what we believe or what we practice, not that we would want to stop them, but we believe that somehow they are defective, that they are lacking, that they're not doing it in the proper way. And we can easily get into the habit of dismissing them or being critical of them and running them down. Now, Jesus is saying, if they are not against you, they are for you. Now, notice what he says, they were casting out demons in your name. Now, I think there's a lowest common denominator, isn't there, in terms of what we believe we should be willing to embrace as regards the gospel and as regards other churches and denominations. I think that lowest common denominator is basically the gospel of Jesus Christ. As long as people believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that He came to save sinners, and it is through personal faith in Him alone that can make us right with God, I think that is the foundation on which any church is to build who they are and what they do. We're to hold to the gospel of Jesus Christ, that He is the way, the truth, and the life. And if that's the case, then I would suggest to you that other people are not against us, but they are for us. If they are opposing Satan by the preaching of the good news of Jesus Christ, then ultimately we are in the same business. And we need to be very cautious about being critical and condemning others. Because, you see, none of us has a monopoly on the truth. We ought to study and to learn. We ought to be informed, but we ought to do it in humility, knowing that we can receive light from elsewhere. We need to have a generous spirit to other people who work for the kingdom of God. Now, I am a persuaded Presbyterian. I suppose I came to the Presbyterian church through my family, and when I came to faith in Christ, I was nurtured and discipled in the Presbyterian church. But apart from that, I am completely convinced that the Presbyterian doctrine, the Reformed truth as we received it from the, the early fathers and through the Reformers, is, as we say at our, some of our public services, founded on and agreeable to the Word of God. And I believe that our form of church government is compatible with Scripture. But if other people are doing gospel work, then we are in it together, aren't we? may differ about baptism or some other things, but we're in the same mission. We can learn from other denominations, can't we? I think we can learn from the Anglican community something about order. We can learn about reverence from the Reformed Presbyterian. 
We can learn about enthusiasm and passion from the Pentecostal church. We can learn about body ministry from the brethren community. And so we can glean from others. But we need to be able to say, if they're not against us, if they're gospel people, then they're for us. And we're doing the same thing. I have gone over regularly down the years to a conference in England, in Leicester, uh, which is uh, run by the Banner of Truth. It's a minister's conference, and I went first when I was at college, and I've gone, I would say, probably 20 times since, and I hope God willing to go this year. And in that conference, there are maybe 300 ministers, and they're from all sorts of different denominations, but they're all brothers. And we all talk together about the work that we're involved in. We don't argue about baptism or about our view of the Holy Spirit in terms of how He operates in people's lives or church government. We talk about how God is blessing in terms of gospel ministry. There's a group that are called the Fellowship of Evangelical Independent Evangelical Churches. And that's what joins them together, their evangelical view of the Scripture and of the gospel. The two preachers who I have benefited most from and listened to most often apart from those in our own congregation, one is an American Baptist and the other one is a Reformed Presbyterian minister in the Irish church brothers in the same business, engaged in the same mission. We're in it together. I suppose the armed forces are a little illustration of this, aren't they? Even if we just take the army. And in the army, we have the Air Corps and the signals and the engineers and the artillery and all sorts of different branches. But they're all serving queen and country and they're all facing the same enemy. And that's what we're in the business of, isn't it? We all serve the same king, and we are facing the same enemy, Satan himself. So there needs to be a generous spirit to our brothers and sisters in Christ. And the secret to all of this is found in the one who spoke these words. Because Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us, came to serve all. He came to make himself nothing and to call the insignificant and the lowly and the unimportant and the marginalized and the rejected, and he called them to come to him, and he spent time with them, and he reached out to them. And he did it in love. And surely that's to be our great motivating force. That if we know the love of God for us in Jesus Christ, then are we not prompted to deal with others by way of that same love? To welcome those who, as Jesus says, are the the little ones of this world and the society around us, and to be benevolent and generous and charitable to our brothers and sisters in Christ who are in another denomination. And Jesus has shown us the ultimate and greatest demonstration of that love as he went to the cross. And he is to be our model. We are to learn from him. And we are to go in his power. To welcome the little people. To embrace our brothers in the gospel. And in so doing, without even being aware of it, we will be great 
as far as God is concerned. I want just to finish by playing a little uh, track that we listened to, I think, a couple of months ago, and the words will speak for themselves. 